morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day three of Sankal 2020. I'm Amit Patia, founder and CEO of Aspire Impact and Aspire Circle, and I'm your host every morning for 30 minutes in this plenary session, Our Shared Impact Future. Today, now 30 minutes on Impact Future, we will have five more inspiring leaders ready to challenge your perspective, literally. Let me take you to Renaissance. In August 1425 in Florence, where Filippo Brunelleschi is standing in front of the Cathedral of Santa Maria, whose magnificent dome is being constructed according to his design and under his supervision. But today he's not involved with the dome. He's handing a mirror and a small painting to every passerby in front of the cathedral. The aim of his bizarre experiment is for each person to put the back of the painting up to one eye and look through the hole in the painting's center. Then hold a mirror in front so that the painting itself was seen through the hole reflected in the mirror. Unaware of the signs at play, the crowd cheered when the real cathedral looked exactly the same as the reflection of the painted cathedral. Brunelleschi wanted to demonstrate that his newly discovered rules of linear perspective could reproduce the exact look of things to the eye, the illusion of a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. This was an important milestone during the Renaissance because it was for the first time art and science were fused together in a common achievement, an image that approximated how the world appears to the human eye. Between 1425 and 1839, perspective replaced cosmic geometry of the Parthenon and the sacred geometry of Chartres with an art whose basic realism was justified by human perception itself. This later led to scaled images and genesis of photography. Today, when you use your camera for a selfie, do spare a thought for Filippo Brunelleschi who helped change human idea of perspective. In sync with the Renaissance perspective, our speakers today are all, all five of them, perspective change makers. Let's first meet Hala Thomas Dothir, CEO of the B Team. The B Team is a group of courageous business and civil society leaders working to transform business for a better world. Hala started her career in corporate America, working for Mars and Pepsi, moving home to Iceland as an educator in Reykjavik University, later leading a successful women's entrepreneurship initiative, becoming the first female CEO of the Iceland Chamber of Commerce. And in 2016, Hala was an independent candidate for the president of Iceland, finishing a runner up with nearly 30% of national vote. Hala understands both business and government. Hala understands impact. Please welcome Hala Thomas Dothir. Good morning, Sankalp. It's a pleasure to join you virtually today and share my vision for the future of impact. For me personally, and the leaders I work with on the B team, impact should sit at the heart of our leadership compass and be at the heart of our economic model. It's been 50 years since the famous American economist Milton Friedman suggested that the purpose of business was to maximize shareholder wealth. This has been the theory at the heart of how we've done business and run our economy ever since. And it has left us facing a convergence of crises, from COVID to climate to inequality. We face a broken social contract the world over. We must now come together to rethink, reimagine and reset our economy to work for all stakeholders. This requires a new vision for how we lead and run both our businesses and our economy. At the B team, we put humanity at the heart of our leadership compass because we see it as our purpose to do business in a way that serves humanity. We also believe transformational leaders must exercise principled leadership to address our global challenges. We see three principles in our leadership compass. Sustainability, because there's no future beyond our planet's boundaries. Equality, because we are facing unsustainable inequality the world over, and there's no business to be done with a broken social contract. 
And lastly, accountability, because we cannot build trust without great governance and transparent measures on what truly matters. Our leadership compass also highlights two personal characteristics we believe to be essential in transforming the way we lead and do business and run our economy. Firstly, we need to be bold. We cannot lead the transformation that is needed with more of the same. We need to dig deep for the courage it takes to rethink and reset our ways. But we also need a lot of humility because without it, we may think we have all the answers or that we can lead this transformation alone. Neither is true. Addressing our global challenges requires the wisdom of many and the radical collaboration of all. But even leaders who put a positive impact and on humanity at the heart of their leadership compass can run into problems in an economy that still incentivizes short-termism and a narrow definition of success. So leadership today must also be systemic. We must push for three massive shifts in our economy. First, we must leave short-termism behind. Quarterly reporting without quarter century vision as to how we will address climate change and inequality must belong in the past. Visionary leaders must share transparently what they are doing to address those critical challenges that we all face. I believe inviting the next generation to the boardroom table is critical to help us see our accountability through the eyes of those who expect us to do better and deserve that we do. Second, we must expand our definition of success beyond the narrow measures that most businesses now have, financial profit and countries, GDP. We need business leaders to account for all stakeholders, whether that is committing to the global goals or committing to transparently disclosing their ESG performance and countries in, uh, committing to well-being and social pro progress in addition to economic growth. I've witnessed firsthand what happens when we embrace gender balance and diversity around the boardroom tables, in the classrooms and in leadership. I have also experienced the shortcomings of sameness and I know that when we have more Johns, Davids and Steves in leadership, we are less likely to put impact at the heart than when we have a Jacinda or a Katrin, Angela or a Tsai. So let's embrace gender balance and inclusive leadership to shift this. Lastly, we must end the Friedman era. This has to be the year that we decide to do so and start the decisive decade of delivering value for all stakeholders. We need an inclusive economy and a new social contract, and that won't happen unless we put impact at the heart of our leadership compass and at the heart of our economy. So to all of you, keep doing the amazing work you are doing. And ironically, maybe your greatest claim to success will be that the impact sector won't be needed anymore because we will have transformed our mainstream economy, our mainstream ideas on how we lead, do business and run our economic model so that it is truly in service of humanity and our only home, the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Hala. Our second speaker for the day is my old school friend and classmate, Tarun Chuk, Managing Director and CEO of Bajaj Alliance, a seasoned banking, financial services and insurance specialist with over 25 years of experience. Tarun started as an investment banker and moved to the insurance industry over 15 years ago. His leadership mantra is company first and believes that tech and digital disruptions are key to understanding our impact future. He's an important cheerleader for the Impact Future Project. Please welcome Tarun Chuk. On financial inclusion, we do know that in the last three decades, we have grown significantly. I'd say grown by leaps and bounds. And that's largely been because of the coming together of various stakeholders, whether it's the government, MFIs, which is microfinance institutions, a regulator, and a lot of 
individual effort by lots of social entrepreneurs who have come together to put that entire microcosm to make financial inclusion possible. While we have achieved this journey and surely helped in uplifting a huge segment of the Indian populace, we have also generated wealth for lots of stakeholders and at the same time being able to develop a very robust model. Today, uh, as a microfinance institution, we've seen lots of institutions like Bandhan, Jana Bank, Ujjivan come up from being an MFI to becoming a small finance bank to becoming a commercial bank and taking financial inclusion uh, in a very robust way. Something I feel which will help reduce the cost of funding uh, for these MFIs. At the same time, that benefit will pass back to the customer. So all, all in all, I think it's a very good microcosm we've created. The one segment, although I would like to call out, which usually is not the very celebrated segment, is women. I think women in rural areas specifically have really come forward to help themselves, to help their families, and help them in the entire journey of this movement away from poverty. I salute the women of India. In addition to this, there's been significant help in financial literacy, which has been an allied service. I have myself gone to institutions like Parinam uh, with my friend Samit Ghosh at Ujjivan and seen myself how women have been working and figuring out what basic mathematics and financial services is, really helps them maintain simple things like books and uh, of finance and figuring out their own savings and planning. Products that have been making it possible are the Jandan Bank, which the government has introduced, Aadhaar, on which we've been able to lay the foundation of identity, without which finance is impossible. Mobile phones, a technology which has been used phenomenally by, by everybody to be able to make this beneficial. Now there are today 41 crore Jandhan accounts. There is now a very strong medium by which government benefit schemes can actually reach the final individual without the pilferage that we have been known to see uh, in, in middlemen, through middlemen. Products like life insurance, health insurance, micro pensions, crop insurance is possible through this medium now. So all in all, we're getting to a very robust mechanism which has been put together now to make microfinance a viable uh, offering. So what lays ahead? Technology, innovation, fintech, digital. These are the words, this is a word map that I see coming in front of us when, when we have to take this to the next level. Lots of things have been done. You see the postman today becoming like a financial consultant to you. Through biometric, the postman can actually today make open an account for you in the India Post. I think a big achievement. The movement towards cashless, the movement towards savings, all this is today possible with, with financial inclusion. Yet to be seen are the benefits of AI, big data, blockchain. I see these coming forward in the future. And I see financial services and fintech come together to provide this platform to take this to the next level. So lots has been achieved, no doubt, but lots more yet needs to be done. Government policy has been useful to now, but the rigor of government policy has to remain. All round involvement has to remain. We need more social entrepreneurs. We need regulatory oversight. We need the coming together of uh, communities to make microfinance and financial inclusion more and more powerful. All in all, I do see a significant future if we are able to put together technology to use and take this to the next level. Before I finish, I would appreciate Aspire through its impact program and the initiatives is taken on the IFP platform. It's, it's true value at the right time. Also, I'd like to congratulate Sankalp for organizing this global conference. Thank you so much and all the best.
Thank you, Tarun. Our third speaker is Aradhna Lal, Vice President of Sustainability at Lemon Tree Hotels. Previously, she worked at Taj Hotels and Unilever. An alumnus of IIM Ahmedabad, I've known Aradhna for years as an Aspire Circle Fellow, a rare talent who knows how to ensure that impact is embedded into the core DNA of a business, not just in CSR. She's a community leader of IFP's accessibility, disabilities, and inclusion community, and as a friend. Today, Lemon Tree has over 10% of his workforce as people with disabilities. Please welcome Aradhna Lal. I'm happy to talk today to all of you about the Impact Future Project. We all know that the focus here is going to be on investable ideas to be covered in the next 10 years, which will actually impact the development of the country and impact the way we live in this country. The area I'm going to speak about today has to do with disability, diversity and inclusion. This work has been going on at Lemon Tree Hotels for over a decade. We've been hiring people with disability and they're part of our regular employee base. What is really going to be important for the future? Some early work has taken place right now, but if we keep an eye on the future, what is really important is accessibility. And this accessibility is of being able to move around. It is of being able to learn and skill yourself. And eventually it's about participating in the economy, which means to get a job in the mainstream and to be able to sustain it over a number of years. Other than this, people who are differently abled must be seen as consumers and people who are in the economy contributing to it by generating income for themselves and also by being able to spend that income. So if you look at areas of work that are required in the future, the first would really be about how shall this person get from their home to their place of education or to their place of skilling later and eventually to their place of work. What are the means to do this? The government has made some arrangements in this area, but there is a lot more to be done. If we compare our country to that of the West, it's very different in terms of how easy infrastructure is, how accessible it is, how a person with any disability can move around. There is safety in it. There are special features in that transport. And this is very, very important. Otherwise, people won't move out of their homes at all. The families will keep them home. The other, of course, is the sheer idea of learning and skilling itself. Any educational institution, any skilling or vocational center must be built in an integrated and accessible way. A person who is deaf, a person who is visually impaired, maybe somebody who's got an intellectual disability or even any other kind of special need should be able to educate themselves and be able to find a job as easily as any one of us can do today. So this is an area I think that a lot of work needs to be done in the future and I think there is a need for investment in this kind of space. The other aspect would be that of being able to grow. So even if a person joins an organization, what is that way that that person can grow if he's specially abled? One of the challenges we face at Lemon Tree is that even if they're skilled in a specific space, say it has to do with the computer, say it has to do with customer service, or maybe it has to be, be something physical like being a chef or something. Once you've learned that skill, you're able to perform that specific role. But if somebody wants to grow in the organization, there needs to be many other leadership skills, financial acumen, many other kinds of human resource management, many things that that person will have to learn. What is the way really to make a well-rounded manager out of somebody who's specially able? This is the question India needs to answer. And I think if you look at education, if you look at skilling organizations, the investment needs to be made in terms of time, money, and as well as the methodology. How will you teach them these things which they were really never exposed to in their youth? It's a very important question. Now, this, of course, assumes that the organizations that they'll be part of, the community that they'll be part of, are all aware and all understand that being different doesn't matter. In fact, being different is good because it brings creativity, it brings new thinking. So one more area I think that we must invest our time and energy in has to do with building awareness and building a truly open mind. You know, at Lemon Tree, when we started this work 13 years ago, nobody in the organization understood this space. 
And the idea was how do we bring along, at that time it was three, 4,000 employees, today it's 8,000 employees. How do we bring along everybody together? How do we teach all of us that, you know, it's okay. Somebody has a different knee, but he will or she will contribute given a chance. So this idea that the community and the society and organizations must open their doors and their mind in a very pragmatic manner. We don't have to be overly emotional. We don't have to mollycoddle. We have to create a safe space where they can learn and they can contribute. And as they grow, we teach them more and more and we teach them new things. Just the way in which you and I have grown in our careers. It's really important to give them a chance. Thank you. Thank you, Radna. Our first speaker today is Nirav Kambati, Managing Partner of Kaizen West and Co-Chair of IFP's Education Employability Skills and EdTech Impact Community. Nirav leads education funding for Kaizen West in emerging Asia and Africa. Prior to joining Kaizen West, he was formerly with Tata Group for 20 years, including last holding roles as CEO of Tata Class Edge and Tata Interactive Systems. Nira finds himself at the crossroads between education, technology, and affordability and inclusion, the trinity for scaled impact. Please welcome Nira Kambati. It is uh, absolutely wonderful to be part of the Impact Future project. Education is poised at a very interesting juncture. And that's not just true for India, but globally. So far, it would not be an exaggeration to say that education has let down our future generations. It just seems that we have given disproportionate amount of importance to access. And that has come at the cost of quality and relevance both. So we've managed to create many more classrooms, but what is going on in these classrooms is not what the world needs at the moment. As a matter of fact, our definition of quality also is very narrow at the moment. And we are at a stage where we perhaps don't even know what needs to be measured such that education can deliver holistic quality to our future generations. And as a result of that, what has happened is we've produced a system which is increasingly losing its relevance. And a symptom of that is the high unemployment that our graduate youth are facing today. And this needs to change. But there is hope in the horizon. One of the largest contributor to this hope, in my view, across the world, is technology. Now, I must say that technology is certainly not the panacea. As a matter of fact, the whole digital divide issue has been brought, brought to the fore by COVID. It just seems that only a third of our children had access to digital devices, which would allow them online learning during the pandemic. So technology is certainly not the panacea, but having said that, there has not been a greater disruptor in many years that has succeeded in bringing down boundaries, boundaries of geography, boundaries which are socioeconomic in nature, boundaries which are linked to learning disabilities, for example. Technology gives me a lot of hope that we will be able to democratize education and take the right kind of education to those who truly need it. The other hope that has emerged is simply because of the bold actions of some of our entrepreneurs who have decided that they're not going to be at the mercy of the education institutions who sometimes can act as a bottleneck more than a facilitator. And so some of them have decided to approach parents directly and have a dialogue 
directly between parent and themselves and in the process made the process of learning improvement much faster than what would have been possible had the institutions not been bypassed. And finally, what gives me hope is the fact that there is now an increasing amount of realization that what needs to be focused on are the outcomes and not the inputs. For a very long time, all our policies were directed towards inputs. How many teachers do you have? What kind of infrastructure do you have? What is the curriculum? But now is the time to shift focus more and more towards the outcome. What is it that our children are learning? Is that learning really relevant for the world that they are about to enter into? Is that learning going to allow them to contribute in a meaningful manner to the society that they belong to? And looking at various initiatives, governmental and non-governmental, that are going on around in India and outside to focus on outcomes, but feels that education is certainly heading towards a dramatic improvement as compared to what, for example, my generation has witnessed. And in that context, some of the key investment themes that one would like to pursue, but also like to see being pursued by others. Most important is attracting more non-state or private interest and investment in education. As World Bank has pointed out, 53% of our children around the world are learning poor. They can't read or write at the age appropriate level. And states where this problem is the most grave, simply don't have the resources to be able to tackle this issue. We are nowhere close to achieving SDG 4 targets by 2030, just on the back of government resources. What is required is a lot more interest from the private sector in education, a lot more well-meaning investment being drawn into the sector. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nirav. Our final speaker of the day is Aspire Impact Advisor, Aspire Circle Elder, and my mentor, Mr. Ravi Kant, Vice Chair and CEO of Tata Motors till a few years ago. Raviji will be co-chairing IFP's Healthcare Medical and Health Tech Impact Community. Raviji has chaired several Tata company boards, and in his current innings, he is focused solely on impact and chairs the advisory councils for an eye hospital in East India and a US-based healthcare company focused on gene therapy to cure cancer. Please welcome Mr. Ravi Khan. It's my pleasure to introduce Aspire Impact which is there in the social sector led by Amit Bhatia, ex McKinsey and Free Markets. Aspire Impact is doing great work to encourage investment in and growth of social sector in India. And as to put it in Amit's word, is to promote enlightened social leadership and to inject an invisible heart to guide the invisible hand of the markets. I have been associated with this very recently at the invitation of Amit. I have 50 years experience in extractive, consumer and auto industries and retired as the managing director and then the vice chairman of the board of Tata Motors. I have overseen acquisition of Devu Truck Company in South Korea and Jankwar Land Rover in the UK, as well as the introduction of Nano Car and Ace Truck in India. Since my retirement six years ago, I've been wanting to, to look at corporate sector in a different way and to combine purpose with profit. And with that, I have been involved a lot in the education and health areas, more particularly in the latter. And I'll give two examples to illustrate that. I've been associated with Akhand Jyoti Eye Hospital, which is engaged in eliminating blindness in the poorer parts of the country and to disadvantaged people, starting from Bihar in Eastern UP, where we want to eliminate blindness in the next four years. Last year, we did 75,000 operations, 80% free of cost, and we want to raise it 
in order for us to eliminate blindness in Bihar in the next four years, raise it to four times to 300,000 operations per annum, for which we are setting up another hospital in the village and some subsidiary hospitals. It is a charitable organization and subsists on mainly grants and aids from people and organizations. The second one is MET therapy. It is engaged in using gene, gene therapy for curing virulent forms of cancer. These are cancers which are mostly either uncurable or require very expensive treatment. Gene therapy today costs anywhere from three hundred to $500,000 per person. MET therapy has been promoted by a group of doctors and professors from Harvard Med Medical School and Novartis. They have several patents uh, with them and they are going to cater to small and medium hospitals and organizations which do not have the facility or wherewithal to be able to supply gene therapy. So they will be supplying through them to the customers or the patients. In order for them to reduce the, the exorbitant costs at the moment, as I mentioned, three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars they are establishing a state-of-the-art world center for manufacturing in India, near Delhi. And through that, they hope to reduce the cost to about forty to $45,000 per patient, and eventually to ten to $15,000 for, 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 for Indians. It is a, a multi-purpose generic platform, and they expect to reach a revenue of $1 billion over the next five years. It will cater to about 10,000 patients per year, and eventually raising, rising to another 10,000, especially for India. So it will have cell, gene, and immunological therapies for cancer. By doing this, med therapy will, is an opportunity for many of us to combine, as I mentioned, profit with purpose. Uh, a great, it's a commercial organization and investing it will, will give very good results and returns. And along with that, you are doing a social good and there is a strong purpose to ameliorate the lot of heavily, heavily disadvantaged people, especially suffering from cancer across the world and more particularly in India. Of course, being a multi-purpose uh, platform, it will start catering to, to ailments other than cancer also using cell, gene, and immunological therapies. So I would like very much and encourage you to look at it in an active manner and to support the cause. And, and as I mentioned again, I repeat, uh, to serve profit with purpose. Thank you. Raviji, thank you. Friends, thank you for being with us once again. Please join me in expressing gratitude to Hala, Tharun, Aradhana, Nirav, and Raviji for sharing. Tomorrow, once again, from 11 to 11.30 a.m., you will hear five great leaders for five minutes each. Once again, a rare treat. Till then, from all of us at Aspire Impact and Aspire Circle, goodbye.